Good afternoon. <laughs> I, can, I, I think I can use a little bit more energy. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, it's a real pleasure to be here to share our perspectives on technology scouting and venturing in ExxonMobil. It's really a framework on open innovation. Um, I'm humbled by this offer. Boston is always an interesting place, being the kind of the capital for hard tech innovation around the world, as well as the Lux Summit being a great uh, place for meeting of innovators as uh, well as uh, kind of the corporates who are interested in innovation. I wanted to reflect that the title of today's presentation or today's uh, or, or this session is Evolving Your Innovation Journey. And what an apt title because we are a 100-year-old company with a lot of track record of innovation and yet we have to continuously evolve our innovation journey. I'll share with you, uh, in the context of a very uh, fast evolving landscape in oil and gas and technology, today, US is a net exporter of oil. 10, 15 years ago, it was expected to be uh, importing oil of 70% of its demand. Net importer of natural gas, third largest producer of LNG for exports. So some of you may be curious, why does a company which is in a commodity business with a long track record of internal R&D and innovation, why does it want to start technology scouting and ventures? Is it real? How do we do it? What works and what does not work? Well, I'm here to share some of those practices. I'm confident because we have seen the leads uh, from the pipeline of opportunities that we are working on that we will be able to make an impact on ExxonMobil shareholders, our customers, and society. My presentation here is really divided into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the imperative for energy industry, oil and gas in particular, the role it plays in society, then I want to talk about how ExxonMobil has innovated and how we are changing the innovation landscape, including the technology scouting and ventures. And lastly, I was going to make it real with a project where we have used these practices in my previous job called the open process automation, which led to the formation of technology scouting and ventures. So let's get started. This slide is really the purpose of ExxonMobil, I would say more generally the purpose of oil and gas. On the y-axis, we show human development index, which is really a composite of three factors. GDP per capita, education, and life expectancy. On the x-axis is um, energy use per capita. And remember, it's a log scale. And what you see is the world is kind of divided as you increase the human development index, it requires more and more energy. 80% of the population is in the bottom 20%, 20% of the population is above. If you take today's uh, global population of 7 billion, you divide them, a billion is on the left-hand side, where the only vehicle they have is their legs, not even a bicycle. And a b 1 billion on the right-hand side, which have cars. And in the middle, you got three billion with only bicycles, and then two more billion with a motorbike or a scooter. That's the, that's the current state of society, and everyone is kind of moving towards the right. Every year, roughly 100 million people move into middle class. With middle class movement, you need energy, you need appliances, and you need access to transportation. That is the story of energy industry, that's the story of oil and gas as we produce materials and fuels to enable the growth of humanity, to, to enable the development of humanity. So what we do in ExxonMobil is really we take all of these factors every year and we look at the supply side, the demand side, the technology, the regulatory situation, the policy, and we build a bottoms up energy outlook in which we then use that to allocate capital for our investment and allocate where we take our technology bets. This is not the world we wish to live in. The energy outlook is the world we plan to live in. 
So it has a lot of assumptions on policy. So let's look at the summary of it so we can get going on the innovation. The summary of this is first, energy powers modern economies and living standards. Energy demand will grow by 25% from 2015 to 2040. Almost all of that is in the emerging markets, non-OECD countries. Electricity demand nearly doubles in the non-OECD, kind of consistent with the human development index I talked about. Large increases in solar and wind, almost 400% increase. Natural gas expands role to meet a wide variety of needs. Oil plays a key role for transportation and industrial sector, particularly chemicals growth. And last, the world is going to evolve where it's going to decarbonize by 40% on an economic metric. I'm going to talk more about it. In the developing world, not shown on this picture, is significant improvement in urban air quality will occur because of fuels improvement, inspection regimes, OEM hardware, and so on. That's the world we we'll plan to live in. That's the world in which we allocate our capital and our technology beds. Let's drill one step into it. And this shows the overall energy demand. On the top side, you will see it increases by 0.9% per year. That leads to 25% improvement. Oil grows up by almost 0.7% per year, two thirds of the overall growth. Natural gas grows faster because of its low carbon footprint and low emissions. Coal increases for the first 10 years and then decreases basically flat over 25 years. And then very large increases in non-fossil. If you look at energy demand, transportation all tied to oil, industrial tied to coal, to coal oil, and gas. Power is where all these compete, the non-fossil, as well as gas, as well as coal. There is almost no oil in power. And residential commercial is where gas and biomass come into play. That's kind of the distribution of this. But we want to help society grow its economy while minimizing the impact on the environment. And that's called the dual challenge. And the next slide shows the factors that go into that. What I show you here is the y-axis, which is a metric of energy efficiency, how much energy is required for GDP, and the x-axis, which is how much greenhouse, emission, greenhouse gas emissions are there per energy unit. And you will see that from 1980 to 2015, we are marching down where we are improving efficiency, going down on the y-axis, a little bit on the x-axis. And then our outlook shows that going from 2015 to 2040, we further march down the efficiency. With the current technology sets and the expected cost, that's where we're going to land in 2040. That's our planning basis. It falls a bit short of the Paris two degrees, which is shown by the line there. And you can see that more improvements in efficiency and greenhouse gases are required. So what is required today is implementation of technologies that we have, as well as finding new technologies, and that's the role of innovation to meet the Paris two degree goals. So let's look at what ExxonMobil can do. Right now we are working on all four of these bars. The first one is improving energy efficiency in our operations. Typically when you drive a car, 20 miles per gallon, you produce a pound of CO2 per mile, and it takes another 0.2 pounds of CO2 per mile to get the gasoline to the, gasoline to the station. That includes, it, includes producing crude, moving the crude, refining the crude, taking it to a distribution terminal, and then putting it in the gas tank. So here is where we mitigate emissions by improving efficiency, reducing flare, using cogen, and where cost effective, using low greenhouse gas electricity. We bet a significant portion of our technology on developing affordable and scalable lower carbon technology solutions. This include um, things like biofuels, carbon capture and storage, process intensification, and so on. And then we also produce materials that improve 
the use of energy and the use intensity of materials in its use pattern. For example, plastics, for example, fuels, for example, tire inner liners that go into cars to improve efficiency of a car, for example, um, lubricants and greases. All these go into improving energy efficiency of the overall system. And lastly, policy to get to solutions that can stick. We have a long history of innovation. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to say that almost every decade since 1920s, you can almost think about something that ExxonMobil has done that has affected your life. Probably one of the innovation that all of you are carrying today is a lithium-ion battery in your phone. So let's move on. Underlying all this innovation is technology. And when you look at technology, there are a few elements that we have practiced over the years. One is technology is central to continued success. Technology needs a steady hand. You can't increase and decrease R&D budgets every year. I call it, it has a feedback loop of seven years. You just need to stay steady. You can choose where you want to be, but don't take it too up or too down. And we are blessed with leaders who see it that way. We are leading industry in technology development and application. We have a different portfolio for breakthrough technologies as well as incremental advances because it requires a different way of managing risk. We integrate them and, and apply it within the ExxonMobil processes and system, and ultimately, it depends on people. And that's why we have roughly 2,000 PhDs in our organization. But the technology landscape is not steady. The technology talent is not steady. I look at six forces of change that affects our business. Number one, where are the resources? I talked about how US is now producing a lot of oil and gas. I talked about demand, almost 100 million people coming into middle class every year. The other forces of change is globalization and where talent is. That changes where do we do the work, what kind of work is done. Digitalization, which is a theme in this conference, that determines what work you do and where the work is done. And then on the market-facing side, there is sustainability as well as greenhouse challenge. These are the six things that are changing the landscape. And that changes the innovation landscape around the world, and that's changing that's how we are evolving our innovation journey at ExxonMobil. And so that's the reason why um, we have formed the Technology Scouting and Ventures Group. This slide just is a busy slide. I don't want to go through each one of them, but sometimes the change that we see from year to year is very incremental. And it really takes you to think about it over a 15, 20 year timeline to see how large a shift that is. So you go back 20 years and you go forward 20 years. Of course, there are no facts about the future, so this is kind of my estimates of it. When I was in graduate school, I remember how research was done. When I joined Exxon and Mobil, I remember how research is done and it's done quite differently today. The outside world is a much larger component of R&D. So here I've kind of headlined it as 1985, individual or internal technology, 2015, leveraged or network technology, 25, highly democratized technology, where the inputs to technology are now democratized. It's no longer held by mid to large size companies alone. On the bottom, I write accelerate, accelerating pace of innovation as well as global sort of global ecosystem. I'll just read a few of them. You know, the model which is going from inventor to innovator and in integrator to a Hollywood model. And people would say, what is a Hollywood model for technology creation? This is where you know, an actor and an actress pick your favorite, come together just for creating that movie they have more allegiance to each other than the director or producer. And we have put teams together, and they work like a charm. 
They also have their downsides if you don't change your management system, which is they have more allegiance to each other than the organization. But when it works, it works like a charm. Enabler. The enablers which were there when I came out of graduate school 30 years ago are different than the enablers today than the enablers 20 years from now, which requires a constant sort of reinventions of ourselves. I talked about access and then funding. Access was limited. Access is now broadly available. We see startups in core and adjacent space. We see EPC companies in startup space now, which was never heard of even five years ago. Private equity, of course, independence participating. And going forward, we see startups in core. We already see a lot of high net worth individuals and affinity groups being set. For those who are in pharma, there are affinity groups doing clinical trials, development of drugs. In our space, you just look at breakthrough energy ventures where 20 billionaires have come together to drive technology. The new trend is crowdsourced venture capital, where it's no longer just with people with a lot of money. Someone with little bit of money can also get into venture capital space. Anyway, these are the trends. So the question for us is, how do we evolve our innovation system? How do we adjust ourselves to this changing landscape, both within ExxonMobil in the US as well as abroad? So here's how we have evolved first our innovation system, which is a combination of four different ways in which we innovate. In fact, it's a combination of all of them, top down, bottoms up, inside out, outside in. Let me just start from the 12 o'clock position, which is top down, which is we drive a strategy, driving what opportunities are there. We do six month time bound, deep dive with six to eight people, maybe four people from outside doing opportunity identification exercises. This includes techniques on how to engage the outside world at short notice, as well as techniques to remove hierarchical, experiential, and organizational biases out of the system when choosing opportunities. On the, on the three o'clock position is kind of the classic do the science to come up with discovery to drive opportunities. ExxonMobil is one of the few oil companies that has a dedicated science budget where we decide on 10 different areas where we want to take the lead in the world. Bottoms up is to look at all of the different innovation cognitive surplus that's there in the organization by running an internal venture fund where people pitch their ideas on the spot. We uh, give them awards and within six months they show us some progress in this. Of course, people don't believe it if you don't follow through, and we have 10 years of experience on what works and what does not work. In the bottoms up, I would say it's been more successful in finding innovators than finding good ideas. You know, that's an easy way to find the good people who are there. Uh, the biggest change is in the outside in, and that's where technology scouting and ventures come in, and the previous chart showed what are the difference in them. Just ideas is not alone, and this chart is just to remind me that there are many different components of an innovation system. You need to align on strategic intent. You need to get senior leadership on your side. The point of ambidexterity, where the tension comes around resources, rewards, management time, needs to be appropriately located. If you keep it too high up, you don't get management time. If you keep too low, it does not have strategic significance. And the point of ambidexterity for longer term, higher risk has to be higher up than for the near term. There are, of course, three different stages, discovery, incubation, and scale up. And the enabling components are culture, which is bias towards action, future back, and weak signals. Metrics, which are learning oriented. Talent, a key part of talent, is to bring outside and inside talent, and how do you do that without causing a lot of friction in the organization? That's where the experience comes into play. Uh, processes, assumptions testing, business model innovation. We use a process called um, want, find, get, manage, the four steps. First you find your wants, then you get, get it from the outside, then, uh, then you find it, and then you get it, 
It's not just get, it's get and adopt. And I really don't like to use the word technology deployment. It's always technology adoption. Adoption means that the other party, you have to convince them to use it. And there's an art to adoption. And then manage. Um, I'm going to talk about that a bit more later. So let's talk about scouting and venturing. Here's how the team was formed a year ago. Um, it's an outside-in technologies, practices, business models for current and emerging businesses. Remember, it's, there's a reason why we put practices and business models. We locate personnel in the various innovation hubs around the world, India, China, Europe, San Francisco, Boston. Uh, typically, the people we put in are people with business and technical experience who have some stripes so that the biggest and the toughest part of a job is to get the businesses to adopt. And that's where you really need the stripes and the internal network to pull it together. We incubate, incubate on a selective basis to enable readiness. Typically, these are six-month sprints for incubation. We define how we are going to measure progress, and we incubate. We take equity in startups where appropriate. The next are our 14 areas of scouting. There's a lot of detail there, but I would just say the last 13 areas are current Exxon Mobil businesses, which are very simple. We take oil and gas out of the ground and convert it in, move it around and convert it into fuels and materials. And these are around finding oil and gas, producing oil and gas, moving it, converting to higher value products, making sure that these assets are protected with reliability, safety improvements, making sure you you're digitalizing where it's necessary, and also industrial cybersecurity. There are a few things related to products like product sustainability, carbon capture utilization and storage, new hydrocarbon products, CCUS, carbon capture utilization and storage. There's one area which is capital projects. ExxonMobil spends roughly sort of 30 billion, 35 billion on capital projects every year, which is roughly $100 million in 24 hours. So getting effectiveness in capital projects is a key part of our charter by getting outside in technology, both digital and non-digital. And it cuts across the entire space from business concept development to project development to project execution to a startup. You will see that I said 13, not 14. And because I'm going to get to that, but the 13 areas, we have two boundary conditions. One is that a proof of principle or a prototype should be ready. And second condition is that we need to be within one adjacency from our business model. If you go too far out, which is you do a different feedstock and a different product, you're two adjacencies away. It gets more risky to accept it in our organization. We can criticize that, that we may be losing opportunities on the table, but so far, we have so many opportunities that that's not true. We may relax the, con con the, the condition later. The, fourth, the 14th area is new leads for greenhouse gas challenge. This is completely different. These are areas of greenhouse gas challenge in cement, in agriculture, and many other areas, which has nothing to do today with ExxonMobil business, current business. That's where we put an additional constraint, which is that it needs to be sizable in terms of greenhouse gas. And the way we have put a size on that, it needs to be half a gigaton per year. Here are some technology evolution principles that guide what opportunities we select. I'm just going to highlight one or two for the sake of time. First is that technology development requires longer term focus and is unpredictable. It benefits from a portfolio approach and the portfolio is tested for efficiency, what you start, stop, and continue. Sufficiency, can it meet your objectives? Alignment, whether it meets the strategy or not. It may require business model innovation, especially in new to world. The extent pace, and it comes many times from science and technology developments in unrelated areas, so you need to have a scouting for that. Technology, even though it's unpredictable, evolves in two different patterns. And this is the really important part of it. It comes from a top-down approach where it comes in early use segments. And then as its cost goes down and the scale improves, then it comes into the second and third and fourth. Sometimes we are in the first segment. Sometimes we are in the fourth segment or second segment. So we have to decide which segment are we. If we are in the fourth segment, we don't need to bet on it now. We can just see it. 
And there are some areas where it comes bottoms up. It comes in the least demanding segment and then moves up as it's proven. Because we are a global company in many different uh, um, political enclaves, we do two different tests. One is that the widespread technology adoption is driven by long-term fundamentals, and market-driven selection makes it more robust. If you pass these two tests, it's likely to be accepted in many different enclaves. I'm going to just take a few minutes to talk about open process automation to show some of the examples of the practices I talked about. But you know, what is open process automation? You know, we are in a world today where, just to give an analogy, if you buy a toaster oven and you go to your home, in process control systems, when you buy a hardware, you have to have your own plug that the suppliers gives you. There is no standard around plugs. If you buy a new computer today, its analogy in process control system is you'll have to rewrite all your Excel spreadsheets. If you have a cell phone today and you go to a different city, the analogy there would that the Verizon cell phone cannot talk to the AT&T cell phone. This is the real world of, the, of distributed control systems that we have, where the current incumbents have bundled up hardware, software, and services. And so when we looked at the root cause, we said, we really need to open the system for innovation. And this was not a nirvana on our end. We just found that there were adjacent industries like avionics and telecommunication where that change has occurred. And so we went through a one fine get manage framework. We actually went through three cycles. We looked at the inflection points. We got open group from San Francisco to come in and build the standards and now have created an ecosystem of participants, the current incumbents, as well as new participants and the user. So I'm not going to go through this slide. Uh, these are available. This is our vision for automation. This are the set of incumbents which are there. You can see a lot of end users, the current incumbents, new entrants, all along the stack of the process control system. This is where the innovation that we have done is what I wanted to elaborate on. So we did three cycles of want, find, get, manage. The first cycle, we actually got our wants wrong because we were not sure what was feasible. That's when we stumbled across avi avionics and uh, telecommunication industry and what has happened. We looked at, that led us to looking at inflection point. We found that business transformation was more challenging than technology. We use an agile approach with a six to nine months cycle. We combined our outside capabilities. In this particular case, Lockheed Martin led the transformation of the avionics industry, so this was done early on with Lockheed Martin as a key partner. The skills that Lockheed Martin had, the experience that Lockheed Martin had, didn't, was not there in ExxonMobil. The domain expertise that ExxonMobil was not there in Lockheed Martin. Um, and then captures. The inflection points are shown here. They are software replaces hardware. Many times for controllers, you don't need hardware. It's just a line of code if its availability and its reliability is good. We have gone, as the network latency improves, we have gone from one to many backups to many to one backups, from a built-in, from a bolt-on to a built-in security and edge computing and IoT transformation. The key thing I want to show you is the very complicated equation in the yellow box, okay? Many times, we start with our internal capabilities and see what we can solve. But you really have to start with the impact C and come back with what combination of A and Bs do you need. Do you work in the current organization with a very large A and a small B? Do you even know what Bs are available outside? Do we know what Cs are needed? Or you work in an environment where your allegiance is to see irrespective of where the A and B come from. That are simple questions, but very difficult answers because it gets to the identity of an organization. It gets to what we are trained in graduate student, what makes, what we perceive as success and not success. I don't have enough time to talk about it, but... Uh, <laughs> Here is a uh, collaborative development plan with many of the partners. Some of them are here. So we have created an ecosystem. And then in a nutshell, 
breakthrough technology and innovation is needed for addressing dual energy challenge, the technology scouting and ventures, captures and incubates outside in ideas, practices, and business model. And I showed you an example of, uh, of uh, open process automation. So I want to get back to the theme, which was evolving your innovation journey. And I hope I've shared with you how ExxonMobil is evolving its innovation journey. Thank you for your time.